Bibles and turn to Acts, the book of Acts, and we will turn to chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. Sometimes called the, the handbook of the early church because, well, if you want to know how it was for the early church, Acts is it. So let's hear uh, from Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say together, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh God, indeed, we are grateful, and uh, grateful for this time. Tuning in, gathering in person, uh, listening, viewing sitting here in the sanctuary, all. So we are connected uh, one to each other in your name and for your name's sake. Take this time and receive it and bless it, and may it be for your glory and all for your sake. In your name we pray. Uh, amen. Uh, this morning we're going to conclude the series about following the way, the importance of following Jesus. You know, and it makes me think about the question, have you ever heard the term, let's, uh, let's just go back to basics. Let's just, let's just deal with the basics. Uh, when anything has become clouded over time, it is a good idea to go back to the basic fundamentals of where things started. I would contend that for Christianity, when things get clouded, when things get out of focus, our basic fundamental is to get focused, refocused on the person and the work of Jesus. Before we start getting into issues around doctrine and practice, uh, before we start dealing with, with worship and, and, and style, before we start talking about which mission efforts we're going to do, uh, get over into the substance of church life. Let's talk and focus on Jesus. There are things, big and small, that have the opportunity to give progress to our life if we just did them with greater consistency and regularity. Flossing every day. Apologizing more often. Regular exercise. Say thank you and excuse me. Save and invest rather than spend and consume. These are not, you know, shiny and new things. I mean, these are not, you know, the, the oh my gosh, that's, whew, what a burst of insight. No, these are regular, basic Fundamental things that are known, they're tried, they're true. So it is from accounting to astrophysics to education to engineering to fly fishing to firefighting to computer programming to construction, from rock climbing to rocket science, from raising kids to raising capital, all of these things, all of them, and everything else in between consists of just very fundamental principles. And each fundamental counts, makes a difference. Success in anything, really, 
in all its forms consists of simple fundamentals. Truth has not and will not be changing. Summer always follows spring. That's not up for debate. That's not going to change anytime soon. Um, the fundamentals that produce, you know, success, numbers, interest, passion, excitement, all the things that, that we really value and cherish have all been identified and are in place. The Asian philosopher Confucius nailed it when he said over 2,000 years ago, to know and not do is to still not know. For the followers of Jesus, from the very beginning, the main thing was to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is Jesus. The book of Acts opens with the launch of the movement that we now call Christianity. On their first Sunday, their first Sunday, 3,000 people came to faith in Jesus. You talk about a good first Sunday. On their second public gathering, 5,000 were added. Historians and scholars go on to record that within six months of Pentecost, 50 days after Easter, there were over 100,000 new Christians in the city of Jerusalem. And here's a point we all do well to remember, that every single one of us, every single one of us, sitting here, watching online, listening somewhere this morning, all of us trace our spiritual lineage, if you will. We all go back to those folks in Acts. Acts chapter 2. What was it that enabled them to be so mightily used for God? I mean, think about the disciples. Think about it. They were a ragtag bunch of nobodies. They really were. Uh, nobody knew their names. They, they didn't have a platform. They didn't have a communication plan. They didn't have a social media blitz. They didn't have anything like that. Uh, nobody knew where they came from. But yet, history records that God used them. And remember, one of them in the midst of all of it became a traitor. God used them to literally turn the world upside down. The world has never been the same. So what was it like in the first century? Acts says that all those folks that gathered and decided to follow Jesus committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles. They shared life together. They ate a common meal together. And they, they engaged in prayer. Everyone was in awe of the signs and wonders that they did. And all the believers lived in this, this harmony together, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they had and owned, and they, they pooled all their resources together. So each person's need was met. So, so needs were met. They went daily to the temple to worship and praise God, and every day, every day, their number grew. The early church was, was loving and faithful and simple. They trusted God, and they did what God said. For them, the fundamental things the fundamental thing was that they heard the voice of God and what they did is they responded in obedience and faith. The people together. Together. They, they, they all wrapped their hearts and minds around the same thing. Jesus. 
And what was it? Well, it was Jesus. Jesus, who, who brought the kingdom of God, that, that they, they, they focused in on that. They honed in on that. They, they, were, they were swept away by it. They were caught up with it. You know, the, the kingdom, God is the ultimate, the kingdom of God is the ultimate redemptive mission of God. The kingdom of God is the sovereign activity uh, 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 in the world of bringing people, God bringing people into right relationship with him. The kingdom of God is the big picture of what God is doing in the world. And to beat it all, they had a spirit, God's spirit that was right behind them, pushing them, fueling them, instructing them with them all the way. Francis Chan, he, he's a, 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 a contemporary author on, on church things. He wrote a book called The Forgotten God. I've, I've not read it, but this quote from it really spoke to me. He said, when I read the book of Acts, I see the church as an unstoppable force. The church was powerful and spreading like wildfire, not because of clever planning, but by a movement of the Spirit. Riots, torture, poverty, or any other type of persecution couldn't stop it. Isn't that the type of church movement we all long to be part of? So it is. God calls us, calls the church to journey back, to refocus, to revisit get back to the fundamentals to live by those virtues and practices of the early days you know, the basic we go back to one of the basics that we go back to is that God has called us God has called each and every one of us it's not just clergy that are called everyone is called and God has gifted every single one of us there is no such thing as a giftless person I dare you to go find me one. I dare you. God has called us together to be the presence of God in the world. I've said it before. I'll say it again. When people say, I wonder what God is like, they look to the church. How does Jesus operate? They look to the church. That's us. It's through the demonstration of of God's love. It's 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 the it's it's the demonstration of that that people will see peace in a world that is often chaotic. They will experience connection when there's isolation. And they see and experience the kingdom. Hear me when I say this. Now, all of you could throw something at me, and the folks online could just throw something at their computer screen. But don't do that, please, because you might hurt your computer screen. Practicing the Christian faith is not about believing in Jesus. Don't throw Okay, nobody's going to throw anything. Great. Practicing the Christian faith is not about believing in Jesus. It's about the life of Jesus, about his life coming into your life and my life and forever transforming us into that image that who we are together who we are individually that Jesus is reflected Jesus is seen in other words we live it Pastor and author Michael Slaughter put it like this. We must remember that our true purpose is not to bring the world into the church, but take the church to the world. I like that. We're not a gathered people just to be gathered. We're gathered in order to be sent. Here's the crux of it. Easter, having been celebrated... And we acknowledge that. Jesus is risen. We are a people of the empty tomb. Resurrection has taken place. Jesus is up. And now we follow Jesus by being people focused on God's mission. 
reflecting the reality of God's grace and mercy living, living like resurrection people. You know, it's, it, it really is the fundamentals. It's the basics, doing the things like, you know, attending, giving, involvement, doing, serving. All of these things, all of them, not shiny and new, but all of them, they show the reality of being a people of the empty tomb. They show us that reality is well, real. It's real. All that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, you know uh, I, I can't make anybody do anything. You know? And that's probably a good thing because it, it'd probably go to my head. It really would. You know? Whew. I'm sorry. I, I wondered there. And it's just, you know, I can't make anybody do anything. You know, now don't get me wrong. A pastor has influence, has persuasion, uh, skill, uh, seeking to work with people, trying to be convincing uh, about uh, you know being doing every best effort to be he or she to be a spiritual leader. But he or she can't make anybody do anything. We we're just not vested with that power at ordination. It'd be really cool if we were. But we're not. We're not. To make church and spiritual pursuits something meaningful in your life and your family, I can't make anybody do any of it. We have to choose. Taking seriously being a people of the empty tomb to give, to pray, to attend, to serve, to, to get your kids here, to get your youth here. Um, I will work my dead level best. I will, I will seek and I will use all the skills that God has given me. And if I don't know a skill, I'll go learn a skill. If I, don't, if I can't learn the skill, I'll go find somebody that has a skill. But I can't make anybody do anything. Please let me say this and say it with the highest degree of love that I can. If there is power and awe in the reality of the resurrection, in the work of God in Jesus, if that's there, if that's real, then why is it that attendance and giving and serving and prayer and involvement, why is that not the center of your life and my life? And I say that with love. And I trust you'd say it with love to me. Christians in the early church were different from the rest of society. The gospel didn't just, uh, wasn't about, you know, experiencing eternity after death. It was experiencing transformation now. It was experiencing difference now in the present. In the present. With the power of the empty tomb, resurrection, a reality, Jesus was up and out, living and doing. Christ is revealed in the world when we show love to others. Jesus is ultimately not revealed in church buildings or political power or, or, or in the popularity of, of how popular Christianity is in the popular culture, but it it is uh, revealed to the world when those who follow Jesus 
love. Jesus declared, of all the things he said, one, well, one of many, but one really stands out. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you are also, you are also to love one another by this. All people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You know, ultimately, at the end of the day, um, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to play church. I just don't. And I feel quite certain that none of you do either. Following Jesus has got to mean something to you and me. It's got to mean something. It's got to. It's got to change our perspective, what we do with our time, what we do with our gifts. Jesus is so worth saying no to other things in order to be a part of things here that connect us with Him. Jesus matters more than anything. I mean anything. And we live and we act like, you know, that, that matters. That counts. What does it mean for us? You know, as, as Leonard Sweet put it in, in, in his, I mean, it's a great book, I Am a Follower. The heart of Christianity is not a cause, but it's a person. It's not so much about ritual and rites as it is about relationship. It's not about following a, a, a program or a theological platform, but learning to love a person. Jesus is both message and messenger. To know the gospel is to know that Jesus is the good news. He didn't just tell it. He is the good news. We are not commissioned to start a new ministry, but we carry on the ministry that Jesus already started. We make Christ's way our way. His life our life. We take on Jesus' mission, and it dwells within. And we're continually being molded and shaped and formed individually and together into being better followers. Following Jesus is the ultimate mission trip. You ever heard people go, when they go on a mission trip, whether it's something local or abroad or national, and they go, that was awesome. Awesome! That was a spiritual mountaintop experience. You ever hear people say that? A lot of our youth will say that. I know I said that when, when I was a youth and when I was a youth director. I mean, mission trips were just great. Following Jesus is the ultimate mission trip. So we go back to basics. And following Jesus, we will become different people. But to be first, we have to be last. To be greatest, we have to be least. To find ourselves, we will have to lose ourselves. To be exalted, we will need to be humbled. And what makes Jesus so unique among any and all the teachers of the day and the time? He says, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And it's not somehow that we love God so well. God loved us first. The stance we take with Jesus is one that is relational. It's one of love and trust. When we belong to Jesus, we belong to Him. And we have a mission. The church, the body, us. We show Jesus to the world and we reveal the love of God in Jesus in the way we love. Let's pray.
Holy God, merciful God, help us, guide us, show us the way, teach us the way, more of the way, to follow you, to follow your Son. And help us to just embrace in heart and in mind that He is indeed the good news. He is message and messenger all at once. In the name of your Son, Jesus, and for His sake, we pray.